excited to be here. Um, I have talked to my classes earlier today, which I wasn't able to be in the conference because I was teaching. And one of the things I said was um, about a decade ago when I would go to 3D printing conferences, um, you know, it was a possibly a room of maybe a thousand people. And there was possibly only 10 women in that room. And also the diversity really wasn't there as well. And, and so I'm really thrilled to see that all these amazing women have this wonderful opportunity to present and that um, pretty much the world can, can see that there's many of us out there. Um, first, I'm going to talk about a little bit um, about my background, um, where I came from and what I do. And then I'm going to lead into also my um, students and what we do here in the 3D printing lab. So my work has always been about nature. It's um, environmentally based. Um, this is a place I would really rather be um, for most of the time in my life. Uh, and if we look at this picture, we see a lot going on. There's um, layers and layers of plant species and um, so, so much um, that is interacting as well within this biodiversity. Also something that um, I'm aware of is that we are surrounded by this. Um, our world is kind of embedded within technology so much. And um, I, in a way, I feel like technology is almost the arm of nature in a way, because there are so many similarities to how nature, um, you know, is and thrives and what we have done, which as a part of nature, we also have created um, some very interesting um, tools in our lives, which I would say would be technology. Um, so as I start to think about all these wonderful plant species and living things, um, I start to wonder even more and my curiosity is, is quite heightened. Um, to step back a little bit, um, as I mentioned, my work is has always been about nature. And so these are some of my installations and sculptures. My background is um, a, as a sculptor. And uh, that was really my, my main goal because sculpture, in a way, it had this opportunity of offering us so many possibilities, so many avenues with the various tools that are out there, whether it is with clay or steel, or even today, I see technology as a tool. I even see data, which I'll talk about more as, as a material um, that can be formed in a way. To quickly go through some of my work, I am an installation artist of, of the past. Um, and I feel like in a way, I'm still that, that same person. Um, my work has been about nature. And in this case, it is about clean water with what you're seeing here in front of you. Um, I collected 400 um, uh, samples of water from 60 locations throughout Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and New York. And then I compiled together one full replica of a stream that has that undulating form and all the samples, all the collections are together. Um, for this piece, it is really because water is ever flowing. Water that is affected here can affect water um, somewhere else. But this is something that is definitely apparent. Um, and it is um, astounding how it just isn't stopping. It's continuing on. And I'm hoping, really, I'm hoping at some point that maybe the world all together will just wake up and do something about it. But in the meantime, we are losing a lot of plant species and um, a big part of our planet that really makes us who we are and, and special. So yes, we are entering the largest mass extinction um, episode um, in the last 65 million years. Um, this is just a map that shows um, where I'm from. And you can see only the places that are conserved um, are protected in the midst of other parts of the land that isn't. Um, there's also this happening, um, as we had seen in the over a year ago with the rainforest and California. So when I see an image like this, I just think of all the incredible 
lost species that have grown within these landscapes and evolved um, and, and had reasons to be there, but no longer are because that landscape is now changed forever. So I would go out and collect samples and start to look at all these amazing, amazing um, naturally engineered forms that have evolved. And in a way, they are like products of today. I, I just think that, you know, they all have functions. They have reasons to being there. So with some research of the past, we have artists like Albrecht Durer or Maria Sibylla Mirian, who documented her work in the life cycle of plants and insects, or even Emily Dickinson in the 1800s, who pressed flowers and plants as well. Another duo would be the Leopold and Rudolf Laschka in the 1900s, who created these amazing glass plant species. If you're in Boston, if you get to travel again one day, and, and I would say venture to the Harvard uh, Natural Science Museum, and you'll see this incredible collection. So to kind of start to really get into 3D printing, um, I started to understand more about this technology and, and the possibilities of what it can do. So I thought, well, I'm going to explore the tools, these newer tools, and see if I too can kind of replicate plants, but even take it to the next level than what the Blaschkas have done with those beautiful glass specimens they created. So I tried 3D scanning. Um, I then went into 3D modeling as well, um, which I had to pretty much teach myself how to use the digital software. Um, it was definitely trial and error. There was a lot of happy mistakes, um, which I always kind of connect a little bit with the Bob Ross mentality, where even in technology, we have happy mistakes and we can just kind of roll with it. And, and we're fascinated by the unexpected. I then finally was able to get to a point where you see now, and this is a wild columbine flower. It's um, a species that we have native in, in our area and it has this wonderful bright red color to it. Um, and it is kind of in the endangered species list. Um, so I felt like it's now time to make it known, to allow people to see what this flower is about and to appreciate all these beautiful forms they have. So I started to 3D print these digital models that I finally was able to acquire. Um, and with that in mind, I took it a little further and I just started to create a full documentation of as many plants and flowers I, I could. Um, but you know, there is that connection to place. And for me, where I live, I'm surrounded by in northeastern Pennsylvania in the United States by a lot of national park. So a colleague in mind of mine, who's a photographer and also a naturalist, we got together. And my job was to replicate these flowers in 3D. So in this case, these flowers, um, they remained white because I didn't have the technology, the facilities at the time to actually replicate these plants in full color. And also they were quite large. Um, the reason for that is that I wanted people to see them differently, almost like otherworldly species, something from outer space. Even though we have these flowers all around us, in the summertime here in the Poconos or Northeastern Pennsylvania, um, you know, people maybe don't see them as they are. So by keeping them white, um, which was the case at the time and enlarging them, people were able to understand that these have beautiful forms and features and respect them as that. This was my way to make people more aware about the natural surroundings. Um, this collaboration between my uh, colleagues and I um, brought upon workshops. We took people out into nature. Um, my colleague told the plant stories, who's the naturalist here, Don Miller, and Mitzi Campbell, who the photographer uh, was. She helped people document them. And then we went back to the studios, and then I helped to 3D print and teach them how to create the 3D models. The technology we have here in this case, like 
the iNaturalist, allows us to um, find these species and understand, you know, where they are, what they, where their background is. Um, and it's a simple app that is free and everyone can download. And then it pretty much kind of gathers data from everybody, all the people around that are documenting and um, inputting this. So that helps me understand what I'm looking at and understanding faster uh, when I'm out in nature. So I'm just going to go through here and show you um, various pieces that I've created. And I'm going to be a little quick with it because there's a lot to show. Um, a milkweed flower in this case. Um, this flower is very important for the monarch butterflies, as some of you may know. Um, and if you look at these incredible intricate features, um, this flower is pretty impressive. Um, it has a mechanism that allows the bee to sit on top of this flower where the legs of the bumblebee then goes, falls into those little slots that you see between the petals that then creates this like bear trap mechanism that allows the pollen sac to grab around the bee's legs. Um, the bee flies off and pollinates another flower then and, um, and the process continues on. But what's nice is that there's this cycle. So, um, and my apologies, the monarch butterfly. There's a cycle that the monarch butterfly then lays its larvae in the stem of the flower, and um, therefore the larvae grows and um, and it, it has uh, nutrients then from there. So it's a wonderful give and take. Um, the wild bergamot. Um, this uh, flower here is about 24 inches long and wide in diameter. Um, and I have various components, about 20 components there that all get pieced together for this large 3D printed flower. The nightshade. Um, the nightshade is quite present in a lot of Shakespearean poems. Um, and it's a beautiful flower uh, where I'll show you a color sample in a little bit. Um, but we could just stop here and I could say that this project, again, allowed me to make people more aware of all these wonderful natural species that exist in the protected land. Um, and one of the things we have to know is that um, I think today technology has kind of pulled us away from nature. But technology, you know, can be used in a good way at the same time. Um, you know, children maybe know about 1,000 logos, um, but they probably can't identify a handful of plants. And with that in mind, there's something sad that we need to come to terms with as a culture. So here's the heel all flower. Um, the Native American would use this. Um, they would gum it up in their teeth and, um, and then it would become like a natural antibiotic, um, but you have to be able to use it on your own cuts and scrapes. And there it is in the color form. It's a tiny little flower that some of you may recognize if you're from the northeastern portion of the United States. We have the jewel weed. So I was working with a lot of very, you know, simple, plain colors, and then I was finding myself adding color onto a lot of these 3D prints. But there's so much out there, and the colors and the forms are quite fantastic. Um, it's quite endless, actually. If I started now, I'll probably never get through designing and 3D modeling all the plant species on this planet. But I was able to understand a little bit more about using full color in the technology and uh, using some skills I've had from my painting background to graphic designer and Photoshop. I was able to kind of pull this together um, to finally replicate some of the plants and flowers. We were fortunate that in our 3D lab at East Strasburg University to acquire the J750 3D printer. Um, this 3D printer is a full color and it has incredible capabilities. So as you can see, you know, for our design students, they can create prototypes and also work in the areas of graphic design to apply to many products. These are just examples of um, objects that came from Stratasys. So now from modeling to learning how to use the software to learning how to 3D print in the last decade, 
um, to applying color digitally as well and outputting, I was able to now finally have a full bundle of species that I can really be proud to show the world. Um, this is a lady slippers flower. Again, another flower that is um, on the endangered uh, species list. And then we have the milkweed, the one that you had seen, um, which was in um, that white color, which made it probably interesting also, but now you could see it in the full color. Um, the milkweed flower has been <laughs> in very various situations um, from very large to very small. And here's just another example where this 3D file uh, could be used in so many different scenarios. I was able to make it very tiny so I can work with a scientist up in Maine and that scientist was doing nectar studies. So in a way, this artwork was almost like a performance now, um, engaging and collaborating with nature. So here's a good example of a lot of the different pieces. Um, this um, is a great example of using Photoshop to um, add color and texture. Um, you know, Google has hundreds of images out there and people are uploading them from all different directions. So it does kind of allow you to have some insight on um, all the imagery that you can capture. Um, so here's another example of, of 3D scanning. And this is the next engine 3D scanner that we also have in our lab. Um, and this can capture not only geometry, but it can capture also the texture or the full color. Um, I used um, my iPhone and took a picture of the leaf where I then brought it into Photoshop and I was able to just add that, that trompe l'oeil kind of texture onto the leaf of the pineapple. And here it is um, while it was being set up and finally printed. Um, so the possibilities are endless. Um, for me, it's been quite a wonderful ride um, and adventure. I do like to travel. I like to go see different species, collect the data, and then bring it back and try to 3D model and then output it in the 3D printer. But I also find that in our virtual worlds, as I 3D model, I also begin to travel a little bit further. I, I investigate all these wonderful forms and I come out of it with such profound knowledge at that point of that individual flower. Um, so it's been quite exciting. I'm just going to speed this up a little bit. You could see just um, different venues and places. Um, I could come back to this too. This is an um, example where 3D printing um, helped establish a um, museum aquarium at our university where we got our students and classes involved. So um, maybe I'll just speed this up for time's sake. I, I have to say that, um, as I mentioned, technology is like a tool and data is like materials, right? Materials equivalent to uh, clay, um, we can compare it to. Um, and with all this data out there and with all the creativity that people have in our world, how can they use it to speak their mind, to express themselves in a different way? Um, my digital data that I've been using um, has been in 3D printed form, and it's almost al also been in augmented reality as well. Um, we have this HoloLens by Microsoft, and again, students can see the possibilities of transferring digital data um, from one output to the next. And then we come to other interests I have. I showed you before about that microscopic kind of view or the slice view of a cell or a specimen. And I think what's nice about 3D printing is that you can actually take um, forms and do things that you've never done before with regular media. Uh, so I started to investigate seeds, which you're seeing in front of you. This is a tobacco seed. And what you have here is the baby embryo of that tobacco seed. The tobacco seed is really the size of a grain of sand. Um, I was able to 3D print the forms in clear on the J750 and then replicate the actual embryo inside as a um, the form 
So people that now, again, can have a different perspective, a different awareness of, of life, of plants, and how they kind of have some similarities to animal life at the same time. This project was at the Whitney Museum. Um, it was in collaboration with a dear friend of mine, Sybil Kimson, a playwright, performing artist, for um, an event that she had um, for the 12 Shouts of the Ten Forgotten Heavens. So let me just kind of move along here. And these are some of the replicas from the event and the performance. I've had the joy of traveling all to the other side of the world to share 3D printing to various cultures, and in this case, um, to women and children in India. Um, I've also been a part of uh, environmental art groups as well. Um, but, you know, one of the things that I still have to keep in mind is that all this joy and fun that technology brings and creating all this work is that there's still stuff happening in our world. Um, here's a project I worked on um, in regards to radiation, um, as we saw the destruction of Chern Chernobyl over 20 years ago. Um, and we got to work with a scientist on, um, whoop, that's my timer. Um, so, um, yeah, so I'm just gonna move along. <laughs> um, you can see just samples of various forms and pieces that I've created throughout um, you know, my experience as an artist using this type of technology. Um, it's been allowing me to create different perspectives and insight into the world. For example, uh, simulating rain on top of a flower. Um, in this case, the flower would have been a lotus flower that um, I was able to replicate the path of the rain and then pull the path out to create the droplets and those paths of that rain. So to me, it's almost like frozen rain. And you can see here just the different versions from the virtual version of that flower, the 3D printed version of the actual flower, and then the frozen rain on top of that flower. And here are the different paths that I was able to create with that assimilation. So there's many applications, there's many possibilities. And I think what I would like to do is quickly jump into um, here, um, my apologies. <laughs> and I would like to show you um, a little bit about my student work. And Maddie, how are we doing with time? Can you hear me? Okay. I'll yeah, no, you yeah. are, you got about three minutes. If you go a minute or two over, that's totally fine. I, for one, for one, am enthralled by what you're doing. This is incredible. So please keep going. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, well, let's, let's venture into now um, the 3D lab really quickly. Um, so my experience as an artist um, kind of has full force has led to me being able to pass that knowledge and that excitement on to, with my students. I have incredible creative students that are here in the lab, not now because of COVID, but uh, at one time our lab was quite full and lively. Um, so I have students that come from many backgrounds, uh, painting and the fine arts, graphic design and product design. Um, I have students that come from outside the discipline, business and computer science and, um, you know, sports management, nursing. Uh, and I try to let them know that 3D printing has possibilities for, for everybody. Um, this is our Stratasys J750. And as I mentioned, you could do all sorts of incredible things with that. Um, so with that in mind, what can my students do? Here's a student that was able to 3D scan an alumni that came back and we made cake toppers for her wedding. Um, so this was exciting because it took a project that the student was doing in the classroom and it actually went full force into the real world. A lot of what we do here in our department is about trying to connect students to the real world. In this case, we had some community artists that were represented and given trophies. Or our students had this opportunity to work with Delta to create a trophy for a project they were working on. We use this technology um, to connect and offer community members new possibilities. Here's a product that we have um, 
this uh, community member of ours um, that his name is Marcus Norris, and he was able to work with our student to create this product. Um, you know, the idea of play and understanding, again, what we can do um, is, is really forever when it comes to this technology. And, and honestly, it's just a spark to a new world. I think I always saw that 3D printing is just the beginning of something even bigger. And I like to kind of keep that in mind with the students that it's maybe not all about 3D printing because there's so much involved. Um, here's an example of the, the class project where we got to work with the aquarium. And we also made these little kind of teacups, um, like teas as in the golf teas, but they would be uh, tapped into the rocky surface in the ocean to plant coral on. Um, so the imaginations are constant here. And um, we just like to showcase all the possibilities. Here's a, an example of a student who actually bought her own 3D printer and she was able to make her own toy where she also had a lot of graphic design skills. So she used all her skills to brand herself and um, create her own little business. So here's some um, GIS data that we are able to create from small to large, and also a little bit of robotics, why not? There's a lot of technology today that has been made user-friendly. So students can create things they never imagined. And that's the thing too, is to try to you know, cross over that bridge uh, where students would be intimidated um, especially artists who are used to being more hands-on and having very, uh, you know, simple, you know, applications where now they can see that there are some possibilities. Um, these are doorknobs that we created in our intro uh, 3D printing class and some other amazing products that I'll pass through. Jewelry, which is so perfect in the 3D printing world. Furniture design. I had this student that wanted to be a furniture designer, but we don't have a furniture design program, but we have a 3D printing lab. So with his modeling skills and his ideas and, and mindset, he was able to create a whole line of furniture pieces. So um, a lot of these students, again, are coming from across the disciplines. Um, here's some architecture pieces of science, biology, uh, this is actually my biomedical biomed student. Um, I always say I, I worry one day if he makes this real. <laughs> um, so 3D printing has brought us a lot of joy and excitement and new adventures and possibilities for, for my, my crew that comes through this lab. Medical printing as well. So uh, maybe I'll stop there. And I can go back really quick, and maybe I could stop for questions if anyone has any. Yeah, definitely. So we have about a minute or two for questions. We are a few minutes oh, over, but it was okay. just so interesting. I couldn't stop you. But one of the most upvoted questions, Darlene, so I will field this one to you is the only question we'll probably be able to get to, is how were you able to connect with so many different groups, and how do they find about you and, like, what you're doing on the college campus? Um, well, um, I teach a course called Intro to 3D Printing. Um, it's a general ed course. And so um, they, students like to, they have to pick up this gen ed course as part of their curriculum. And so they end up coming into the class and then it's my goal to kind of, kind of connect them to their, their careers and what's meaningful to them. And uh, so then I, we try to um, get them to make things, you know, um, make it less intimidating for them. And hopefully I, I like to say that, you know, I like to say that this is a possibility for their future. So I like to encourage that and hopefully it can come back full circle. Um, so our university is really proud of this lab that we have here. And um, so we do like to collaborate and, and work together with a lot for of sure, possibilities. Definitely. Well, I'm going to have to cut it at that, Darlene. What an interesting topic. I'm so glad you're able to participate today with us in type. I had no idea there was this whole other world of 3D printing with plants. So thank you so much for showing me that way.